looks like a tropical paradise, but they tell me we're on a journey to hell. This is the jungle lair of the Abu Sayyaf, an Islamic group which even Bin Laden thinks is extreme. The Philippine army has been hunting them for years. Since September 11th, they've got America behind them with a vengeance. This is the war against terrorism, Philippine style. The US deal, $100 million and now 650 troops to support these Marines. But to these islands' Muslim inhabitants, this is a war against Islam. I was in Manila, in the Philippines, a country of 83 million people and 7,000 islands in the South China Sea. It's Asia's only Catholic country, thanks to Spanish conquest 400 years ago. In this city of 10 million or so Christian souls, there's also around 200,000 Muslims. They live in ghettos, dotted around Manila, and the biggest is a stone's throw from here. The Muslim minority has been oppressed for years. The frustration makes this a breeding ground for extremism. The ghetto's only Muslim civil rights lawyer is Fidel Makayug. He wanted to show me how his people live. A stagnant river of rubbish. Above it, Manila's Golden Mosque, paid for by Colonel Gaddafi. Fidel took me inside a stinking twilight world. Cramped shacks on top of each other. People crammed together, sometimes 30 to a room. He said Muslims are nine times poorer than the average Christian. It's taken decades of discrimination and neglect to get like this. I bet you they don't see many tourists down here. <laughs> no, no, but it's, uh, no, no tourists is coming uh, to this place. I've been warned to be careful in here. This is the sort of place foreigners get kidnapped. Most Muslims come from an island in the south called Mindanao. They want the Catholic government to give it back to them as an independent Muslim homeland. So the migrants from here went down to your homeland and you guys came up here and this is what you get. Fidel said that since September 11th, the police have been rounding up suspect militants here without evidence. Further down the alleyway, I chanced upon a resident who explained why Muslims have always longed for an independent Mindanao. Mindanao is a land of promise. When the Philippines separate, being a republic, the, our forefather in Mindanao, Muslim forefather in Mindanao, they, they stand to separate Mindanao from the Republic of the Philippines. To, to create an Islamic state. <laughs> It's no surprise that George Bush is now bankrolling government forces. Mohammed Atta and another of the September 11 hijackers are both thought to have spent time training at a flying school just north of Manila. Ramzi Yusuf, the man convicted of blowing up New York's World Trade Center first time round, spent a couple of years in the Philippines and his operations were based here in this street in Manila. Those operations included blowing up a Philippine airliner in mid-air and trying to assassinate the Pope Yusuf also spent time with this country's most extreme Islamic group, Abu Sayyaf. Its name means bearer of the sword. Their favorite tactic is kidnap and murder. I'd obtained a tape shot by the Abu Sayyaf themselves last year after they'd kidnapped some Catholic school children and their teachers in a remote island off Mindanao. This bit of the tape shows the room in which the Abu Sayyaf held the women and children and the camera zooms in on this woman here in the corner. We've managed to track her down even though she's very traumatized and is in hiding. She's agreed to speak to us. We drove to the other side of town to meet her. Marissa Ranto was held for seven weeks before she was rescued by the Philippine military. These are the men who kidnapped yes. you. And you recognize their faces from these pictures? 
The Abu Sayyaf demanded the release not just of their members in prison, but also of three Al Qaeda terrorists jailed in America, including Ramzi Yusuf. When their demands were refused, the Abu Sayyaf began raping the women and killing the men. This man was beheaded? Yes, that. And then you made The one beside him, this guy. So the two of them were beheaded. It had been an appalling ordeal, but incredibly, Marissa told me she had begun to understand what lay behind her tormentor's rage. It was time to head south, so I could find out for myself. Well, we're a bit packed in here, but we're finally on our way to the Muslim heartland of the Philippines, the southern island of Mindanao, and it's an island that has been left to rot. For 30 years, various liberation armies have been at war with government forces, and more than 200,000 people have been killed. Well, what we really want to find out down here is just why the Muslim people are so angry. Well, the trouble is that the politics of Islam has disintegrated into lawlessness and criminality, and the trick is going to be actually getting to the story without being kidnapped ourselves. I'd asked for some military security. I only hoped they'd show up. We've got uh, three plainclothes army boys somewhere behind me here who've been tasked with looking after our security. Even now, the Philippine army has been reinforced by more than 600 U.S. advisors. Major Ando, Jonathan Miller. Nice to meet you. Major Julia Torando gave us an intelligence briefing. Uh, first of all, I would like to tell you that the area of responsibility... I thought I'd done my homework on Muslim rebel groups, but I soon realized I was a novice. We have Barhomsa, we have Absa. These are names I haven't even heard of, these kidnap groups. Yes, if you will only pass by along the highway. Major Ando told me where it was safe. I had a limited choice. Oh, don't, don't go off That's the main roads. Right. Don't go off the main roads. Because uh, uh, we could not assure you of security. Yeah. That night, a new group, calling itself Pentagon, appeared on the US government's terror hit list. Locals told me its founder was a well-known psychopath. It's six o'clock in the morning, and I've heard that the leader of the dreaded Pentagon kidnap gang, Commander Faisal Marhamzar, regularly calls into the local radio station breakfast show. And we've come down here to see if he might call in this morning. We don't exactly want to announce our presence in the city, Cotabato, but at the same time, I'm quite keen to find out whether this man is kidnapping people for anything other than money and greed. Faisal called in on his mobile. Three months ago, his Pentagon gang kidnapped an Irish priest on the road north from here. Now, they were holding another priest, an Italian. Priest is dead. The killing's still not confirmed. But they told me Commander Faisal doesn't lie about these things. He, he, he told you on, on air that he, the priest was dead? Yes. Uh, he was saying that he's uh, into kidnapping to raise money to buy arms, firearms. There are Muslims and Muslims. Faisal was a freelance mobster taking advantage of the mess to make money quite different from my next stop, an Islamic orphanage on the road north. To go there we had to drop our military escort, or the Muslims wouldn't trust us. We decided to take the risk. The orphanage is funded by the International Islamic Relief Organization. American intelligence believes the organization's an Al-Qaeda front, a claim it denies. Its Manila branch was run for six years by Osama bin Laden's brother-in-law. The boys here are mostly orphans of dead fighters from the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. Moro is the old Spanish word for the Moors. 
Now it's a martyr's label. Since September 11th, the relief organization has scaled down its Philippine operations, but the Manila branch still funds this place to the tune of $1,000 a month. The director's just been telling me about um, an Arab man who was uh, the director of the reciting school, yeah. the, reciting the Quran down in behind here. Uh, he was employed by the International Islamic Relief Organization, the IIRO, and uh, had been teaching here for four years. He was picked up last week by the Philippines military and accused of links with Al-Qaeda and international terrorism. He says he's been framed. Everybody around here agrees. Absolute rubbish, he says. He was, he was just a teacher. And uh, he says he's just another victim of this war against Islam. The closer you get to it, the harder it is to unravel the concept of terrorist from freedom fighter. There is evidence of bin Laden's involvement here. A local imam was quite open about it. I saw bin Laden once in the year 1988, maybe, or 87. Or here in Mindanao? Here in Mindanao. And he was dressed with Pakistani dress. The Imam told me bin Laden visited the main guerrilla base of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. It was destroyed by the army over a year ago in a brutal campaign which left half a million Muslims homeless. Following his instructions, I drive to a makeshift center which is now home for some of those who got out alive. The children here grew up in a rebel village that bin Laden is said to have gone to during that visit in the late 80s. To them, it was simply where they lived. A community worker had photographs of the destruction wrought by the Philippine army. Many children were killed in the bombing. So this is the Moro Islamic Liberation Front's main base? Yeah. These pictures were taken right after the bombing. Do, do, you, do you remember this? I couldn't help wondering whether these children might have seen too much to forgive. He's, he's telling us that uh, he remembers seeing a lot of kids being hit and some killed, but he cannot really uh, tell how many. Where was the planes? Yeah. We said the planes dropped the bombs. It had been more than just a military offensive. It had been a dirty war on Islam. As for the next photograph, I wasn't too sure whether we should show it to the children. That was a particularly offensive picture there um, of some pages of the Quran which had been used, um, I think, as toilet paper by the Philippine Army forces when they came into the camp. I hadn't realized that none of these people had ever seen the pictures of their former homes before. Into this mess, the Americans have now injected millions of dollars and hundreds of special forces and advisors. They are adamant that the new aid is specifically targeted on Abu Sayyaf terrorists, but who's to say how they'll monitor that? By now, we'd sorted out our contacts in the Abu Sayyaf heartland and felt it was reasonably safe to go there. We flew southwest to the city of Zamboanga. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just landed at Zamboanga Airport. Today marks the end of the holy month of Ramadan, and it also marks the deadline set by the Philippines Armed Forces for their total annihilation of the Abu Sayyaf. There's a massive military operation going on here right now. Kidnap ransom is the rebels' main source of cash. They behead those who don't pay up. They're taking our passport details, even yeah. though this isn't a port of entry, because they want to keep tabs on the foreigners coming in here, because uh, some of those who have come in in the past haven't left, courtesy of the Abu Sayyaf group. As dawn broke, we could see the island of Basilan 17 miles away. About 7,000 Philippine soldiers are locked in a fight to the finish there with a band of Abu Sayyaf. Once, Christians and Muslims lived happily together there. The longer this war goes on, the more corrosive it becomes. We're heading down to Zamboanga's Catholic Cathedral to meet a priest who's come across from the Abu Sayyaf's island stronghold of Basilan. This is a man who's been kidnapped twice himself 
and he's brought with him a couple of victims of the Abu Sayyaf for us to meet. Father Cirilo Nakorda wanted me to meet the survivors from a particularly savage incident. These people are coconut farmers. One day, last August, the Abu Sayyaf came down into the village and kidnapped 13 men suspected of being Christian vigilantes. Lito Andaya was the sole survivor. He described how the other 12 men were taken off one by one and beheaded. One of those killed was Mrs. Ramos's son. She later found his decapitated body. We have wept an ocean of tears, she told me. Sometimes it's hard to love your neighbor. Father, it must, it must really challenge your ability yeah, I to... cannot uh, deny him. I have this feeling of anger. I, th I think we've got to stop this, actually. Each side suspects the worst of the other. Neighbors inform on neighbors. We're with some Muslim friends now, and we're heading into a part of Zamboanga called Arena Blanco. It's an area which is predominantly Muslim, and it's an area where people there say that their story is untold because they don't trust the, the media generally because they say nobody's interested to hear what we have to say. The people here are all refugees from the war on Basilan Island. Since September 11th, a new detachment of Philippine Marines has been stationed just up the road. Do, do, they, do they still have a sense of intimidation and fear now that they're in this community? No one wanted to talk. Then they started to speak in general terms about military harassment, but no specifics. Suddenly, one started to tell of his own experience, but he was cut short. We've come across a little bit of a problem here because uh, one of the men was about to open up and tell us a few things, but his wife has basically told him to keep quiet. There's a real sense of fear in this community about the implications or repercussions of them talking to us. I later found out there was a known police informer in their midst. As darkness fell, we were shown the house of a family whose son had been arrested on the usual charge of suspected terrorism. It was too dangerous to be there at night. So we went back in the morning. The man in the white shirt is taking us down to a family here in this Muslim area, very poor area, who he says have been victims of this uh, indiscriminate arrest of people who are accused of being Abu Sayyaf. So, the man apparently from the house has been taken into custody in secure, high security prison in Manila. Azira Mabul is the man's mother. Let's clarify. Was her son Abu Sayyaf? Definitely not, she said. Saeed Mabul was a farmer on Basilan, 31 years old. So this is Saeed. Oh, that's in there. She told me her son was taken to an army base, yeah. hung upside down for eight hours, and had crushed chili inserted into his rectum until he confessed to being a terrorist. The next day, when she visited him, he was unable even to sit down. Mum, I can't take any more, he said. Oh, this is the, these are the list of names from the courthouse. They showed me a list they'd obtained of eight men who informed on him all fellow Muslims. She says their motive was greed. And so these guys all got a million pesos yeah. between them? Yeah, one million pesos. I think can be, can cure him. If, if it's true what they're saying about what happened to Saeed Mabu, it's, it's truly terrifying some of the things that this man has gone through. It's torture at the hands of the military to try to get him to admit that he was out of Sayyaf. Human rights groups say Saeed's story is typical. There was a rash of arrests in September. They say the men rarely get tried in open court. They just disappear into prison, or worse. Meanwhile, long negotiations have finally put us into contact with the Abu Sayyaf itself. 
a man has agreed to meet us, who claims to be a long-standing member. This is where we've arranged to meet. He should be here in a few minutes. He told me that the organization's real name is al harakatul Islamiyad, the Islamic movement. Abu Sayyaf was the code name its founder used while fighting in Afghanistan. He said they have cells all over the Philippines and extensive international links. Fifty members, he told me, were undergoing military training in Syria. And he said that the group's formal inauguration in the Philippines was attended by none other than the world's most wanted man. Well, we've been hearing extraordinary evidence here about bin Laden's own trip to Mindanao in the southern Philippines in 1996. But for the, for the last hour, I've been listening to this man talking from his heart about the desperation of the Muslims of the southern Philippines. And he says, although he doesn't condone some of the excesses committed by the organization, he does very much feel that the principles hold true and he still supports those. And he says there are many, many thousands of others in Mindanao who feel just like him. Finally, I was on my way to Basilan, the hottest new target in Bush's global war on terrorism. I was with General Simatu, mastermind of the final solution to the Abu Sayyaf, and now in command of 650 US soldiers on the island. Somewhere below us, an American missionary couple and a Filipino nurse were being dragged from hideout to hideout by the extremists. The Philippine Marines on the ground were part of the General Special Task Force, but they were running out of time. Welcome to Basilan Island. This is where the Abu Sayyaf group has been holding Americans hostage for more than six months. We are here in this place. The general is a man under intense pressure. He knows a third American has already been beheaded. And we are giving the Marines. For months, the general's men have been scouring the dense jungle. Now they're getting fresh advice from U.S. special forces in psychological warfare and intelligence gathering. Can we make it? Colonel, Colonel. I wanted to ask the general if he thought his campaign was alienating Muslims. No, no. Our campaign is not directed against Islam. It is not directed against Muslim. It is directed against the Abu Sayyaf and terrorists. But with respect, sir, we understand that there are allegations of sort of human rights violations by the army against Muslim people that are sort of driving them again towards supporting more extreme groups. Is there any, is there any truth in that? No, no, no. Uh, actually, in my, in my stay here for several months, I have never received any complaint against uh, human rights. Surreal. Like so much about this war. The villagers treat us to a weird ballet, depicting the peaceful life to which they hope to return now the army's in control. The general told me that for the Philippines to pull its weight in the global war on terror, the army must win over hearts and minds. That includes eradicating the poverty that spawns extremism. Not much chance of that with America's insistence on a military solution. The climax of the ballet reenacts with vivid realism the moment violence and murder came to Basilan. This village is the actual birthplace of the Abu Sayyaf, but it seems a little too early to start writing an obituary for the bearers of the sword.